Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian Letters, Lesson 22, entitled, Who's In and Who's Out? Hello, welcome back. Ready to study the Bible. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, we ended in verse 8 last time. We're going to pick up with verse 8. We started last time looking at this whole lawsuit issue among the believers there in the Corinthian church, taking each other to court in front of unbelievers and the kind of message that that sends. I mean, who would want to be a part of a family that sues itself, right? So uh, let's remember, uh, there already is a trial going on, and the trial is over God's Son, Jesus. You and I are His witnesses. We don't need to mess up our testimony. So better to be wronged, even by another believer, than to take the chance of a bad witness, a bad testimony in our world who needs to hear our responsibility is to give to them the message of Jesus. So anyway, just as a reminder, we're going to pick it up here in verse 8 in just a second, but let's, let's pray together before we launch into this. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you've given us that responsibility. Help us to feel the burden of it. We need to know that we are your witnesses. We are your ambassadors. Uh, we are here pleading with the world that they be reconciled to you because you are coming. And uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And they have an option now to choose to do that themselves. Lord, I pray that we've done that. I pray that as we bow the knee and confess your lordship over us, you would teach us and lead us uh, in your word. You would open our eyes to the things that we need to hear, our ears uh, see, and the, our ears to the things we need to hear. Bless this time now, God. We ask and those who are listening, God, I pray your blessings upon them, their congregations, wherever they are, uh, their families, uh, their ministries, uh, their jobs, whatever, their, whatever responsibility and, and capacity is given to them. Put your hand on them, God, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, dealing with lawsuits among believers, and Paul's effectively going to say, he says, you're acting like a bunch of pagans. Look at, look at verse 8. He says, um, on the contrary, he says, you yourselves wrong and defraud, and you do that to your brethren. And that's what he's talking about. He says, you, you, wouldn't it be better if you were wronged? Wouldn't it be better for the cause of Christ to just forgive and let it go? As opposed to defrauding and, and wronging your brother in public in front of uh, people? At, well, do, for that matter, public or, or, or otherwise, doesn't make any difference. On the contrary, he says, you're acting like a bunch of pagans, effectively. You're, you wrong and you defraud and you do that to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous, the pagans, if you will, shall not inherit? So you're acting like pagans? Don't you know what happens to pagans? Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards. No revilers nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. Yeah. They're sinners. But, it's a big but, right? You were washed. It's not true for you anymore, because you've accepted Christ. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of our God. Are we going to spend any some time looking this morning, afternoon, whatever it is for you. There's some different aspects of God's kingdom. Who's in, who's out, uh, and more importantly, how our present sinful condition can be, become our past sinful condition in Christ. I read a story uh, related to the truth, uh, experience that John Wesley, who helped to found, he along with his brother, what we know of today as the Methodist churches, and he had, uh, by his own admission, as a young minister, he was very uh, judgmental. He was very sectarian. Um, in other words, it's only us going to heaven. Those who believe me, of course, and then 100% of the people who believe 100% of the way I do and all the rest of them need to repent. Anyway, this attitude he had he, by his own admission as a young person. And he uh, had a dream one night. And in that dream, he was standing at the gates of hell. He wasn't going in, but it was like he was there to observe. And he says, and it dawned on me as I was standing there, hey, why not take the option and see if who's actually in there? So he says, in my dream, I hollered down at hell, hey, are there any Presbyterians in there? Like I said, he was sectarian, you know, he's Methodist. Well, the Presbyterians don't, don't believe right, and the Baptists and the Episcopalians. So, any Presbyterians in there? And uh, the answer came back, of course, there's Presbyterians in here. He's like, yeah, I knew that. So he thought, I'll try it again. 
Any Episcopalians in there? Of course. Any Baptists in there? Of course. He thought to himself, kind of swallowed hard, should I ask? Any Methodist in there? Of course. It's like, ooh, I was afraid of that. He said, as soon as I asked the question, he said, I was in my dream whisked to the gates of heaven. So from the gates of hell to the gates of heaven. He said, I stood there and I thought, I'm going to do the same thing. So he starts with the same question, the first question. Any Presbyterians in there? Um, of course not, was the answer. Oof. Any Baptists in there? Of course not, was the answer. Any Episcopalians in there? Of course not, was the answer. Any, like I said, he swallowed hard. Any Methodists in there? Of course not, was the answer. So he concluded his dream by yelling into heaven, well, who is in there? And the answer was, Christians are in here. Only Christians. No sectarians, no, no names. Only those who have come to faith in Christ. So who are the Christians? And we notice Paul doesn't just say here in, in this case, he doesn't just spout out the Christians are the ones who prayed a prayer, the walk denial, even necessarily who've been baptized. Uh, who, who go to church. He doesn't say any of those things. Instead, he lists a, a number of things that non-Christians do. These are the way non-Christians act. And if you see a person act like this, he effectively says, you can be pretty sure they're non-Christians. They're not. It's not that our sins or the lack thereof make us or unmake us as Christians, but is a person saved when they consistently live in an unrighteous life with no regard to the things of God? even though they claim to be a Christian? Really? Is that true? It certainly doesn't seem that way. And I would say uh, your New Testament writers agree with that position, by the way. Look at James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Thus also faith by itself does not have works, and it does, if it does not have works, it's dead. So you got somebody out there that's saying they got faith in Jesus, but they live like a pagan consistently. No heart to God or to the directions of God. Begs the question, are they really a Christian? Some will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. He says, I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, faith goes along with works. Someone who truly has faith will also produce works. And the argument is all the way through the New Testament, someone who doesn't produce works, are they truly saved? That's the question Paul's raising here. Now, as Paul says, this, this is not something we... Can, it's, not, it's something that we uh, need to be clear on. It's also something that we can easily be deceived in. Verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It's possible that they don't know this. It's possible. You know, someone who just professes, well, then they must possess Jesus. Not necessarily, Paul says. He says, well, you can tell them by the way they live. If they profess Christianity, but they act and live like a pagan, you should not give them at the very least the assurance of their salvation. Can't do that. Of course, we believe in the assurance of our salvation. We believe in eternal security. But once someone is saved, they're always saved. But if, is it, you've got to be careful, even though this is a biblical principle, not to imply it in an unbiblical way. So I'm calling you saved because you prayed a prayer? Where does it say that? It says, yes, you have to come to faith in Christ, but that faith produces a certain level, a certain type of works. Uh, again, James, uh, you can see it there, or had it on your screen just a second ago. He's saying the same thing. There's a huge difference between profession, professing to be a Christian, as opposed to possession, actually possessing the salvation that only comes through faith. There is a difference. There can be a huge difference. The Bible says it's possible to profess faith in Christ without actually possessing faith in Christ. Here's Jesus' own words. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone, not everyone, who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, or not everyone who claims to be a Christian, or not everyone who goes to church, or not everyone who claims to be uh, rightly related to God through Christ, not everyone who claims those things actually is those things. Notice, not everyone who claims to, says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Now, understand, don't get the cart before the horse. It's not doing the will of God that saves us. But someone who is saved, the point is, 
will do the will of God. That's the point Paul's making here. Don't be deceived into thinking that living these pagan, living these pagan ways and claims to be a Christian is actually a Christian. Don't be deceived in that, he says. Don't. Not everyone who claims to be a Christian is. Not everyone who professes Jesus possesses Jesus. Martin Luther put it like this. We are saved by faith alone, but not by faith that stands alone. Here's Paul, writing in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith alone and Christ alone. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's not me doing the will of God that saves me. It's not me getting away from these pagan practices and distancing myself from sin that saves me. It's my faith that saves me. But when I'm saved, then I will do those things. Hey, there he said, here's Paul. Here's the, car, here's the horse, which is our faith. Here's the cart, which is our works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. When, when I come to faith in Christ, see, how God created me in his image, right? But that image was lost because of sin. God recreates me in Christ back into his image. And part of what the image of God isn't just, it's not physical, because God, of course, isn't physical. It's my spiritual makeup. And that, that replicates itself or, or produces itself, as it says here in Good Works. Notice, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I've got someone who claims to be a Christian, but does not walk in good works, that should raise a red flag, at the very least. Now, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they haven't been discipled. I mean, I, you know, am I the final judge whether they're a Christian or not? No, I'm not. But I will say this. Be very careful to give that kind of person the assurance of their salvation. Don't do it. I would rather be wrong when I say that they're not a Christian as opposed to being wrong by saying they are a Christian, it turns out they're not. I don't want to give them the assurance. That person needs to learn. As Paul is, 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 is calling on the carpet the Corinthian church, he's effectively saying, don't you know that people who act like pagans actually are pagans? Really haven't been saved? Not that they backslid. They haven't slid far enough forward to begin with. Paul said, you've got people there who claim to have the horse, but they don't have the cart. So I have faith, but I don't have any works. Hmm, something doesn't sound right. People who are claiming Jesus, but living like the devil. Hmm. The other extreme, of course, is to assume that Paul believes someone can lose their salvation by doing things that he lists here. And of course, I would refer you to what Paul just said. By grace, you're saved. Through faith. By grace. So if I was saved through grace and not as a result of works, how is it possible for my works to enable me to lose that salvation? Does it make any sense? If I didn't get saved because of my good deeds, how can I be unsaved by my bad deeds? See, see I, I can't do both. It's not logical. It, it's not biblical. It's not. By the way, if it is biblical, if a truly saved person can truly lose their salvation. Then let me just add to this, and this is a bad interpretation, because it, it's, a bad, it's an unbiblical interpretation to say that someone can lose their salvation. They cannot. They didn't gain it because they're good. They can't lose it because they're bad. But if, if it were possible, and we're going to take, take it to its logical ends, then you have to say a person who can lose their salvation cannot be resaved. Here's, here's a passage that people use to say people can lose their salvation. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For if it is po impossible, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and having tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good work of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. If it is true that a person can lose their salvation, then they can't get it back. It's not available again. Of course, that's a poor interpretation. That's a poor understanding of salvation. You're not saved because of what you do. You can't be unsaved because of what you do. The, 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 the picture here in Hebrews is a person who's come so close to Christ. They've, they've seen the evidence. They've seen other people. They've seen their lives change. They, they've seen the hope that, that they have in Christ. They've seen the miracles and works, works of God. Yet they themselves haven't committed themselves to Christ. 
He says, the person, what more is God going to show them? What, what one more step is God going to do? It's impossible for a person who's seen it all and still refuse to really come to Christ because they've already had all their opportunities. When is that, when is that time? Well, that's, God knows when that time is. So, so it's important, here's the point, of all that Paul's saying here, I believe the most important point. It's important that we take both sin and the grace of God very seriously. Very seriously. The list that Paul gives here, verses 9 to 10, are sins that always will be sins. Let's read them again. These are wrong, they will always be wrong. Do you not know that in the righteous now the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. He lists unrighteous acts, if you will. Fornicators, those who live that way. Idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, the covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, the swindlers shall, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Well, I love that statement. Because, because why? Because it reminds us who we really are. You know, sometimes if we've been saved a long time, like myself, I was saved when I was eight years old. Somehow we think that, oh, I was never a bad person. Well, yeah, you were. You're going to have a show of hands. Those who participated in stuff on this list are going to have a majority almost every single time. Because that's what we were. That's not who we, have, who, who, who we are anymore. Once we come to Christ, he pulls us out of that. The power of God, the good news of Jesus is that we can, what we were or what we are, can become what we were. Our present can become our past in Christ. That's what Paul's saying in the Corinthian church. So this is who you were. I was there. I saw you guys. I was with you. You were a bunch of pagans. But because of your faith in Christ and because of God's rescuing of you, you were pulled out. Let's, let's, let's read what that rescue looks like. He gives a descriptive here. Such were some of you, but you were washed. He's talking about baptism, but not physical baptism. So about the baptism that takes place when we trust Christ in the hands of Jesus, not the hands of some minister that immerses us into the Spirit of God. It's for, by immersion, to be sure. But you were washed. You were sanctified, literally set apart. So you, you, this was true about you, but because of the washing of Jesus, because of the sanctification of Jesus, and one more thing, the justification in the name of our Lord Jesus and the Spirit of God, you are, you're different than that now. See, that, that's the point he's making. He says that a Christian is not a person who's turned over a new leaf. A, person, a Christian is a person who's turned themselves over to God. And God has made these changes in their life. God has moved. God has made what was present for them, now they're past. Such were some of you. Such were all of us. But before we can become anything, any former of any of these things, we have to admit to our current everything. We've got to come to him and say, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. And until a person does that, well, they can't be saved. They can't be saved. Got to come to the Savior. You're not going to turn over a new leaf. You're not going to try to do better. You're not going to reform yourself. These are not things by, me, by which we can be saved. You can't undo the things you've done anyway. You have to take the, the penalties and the wrongs, and they've got to be erased by the hand of God in exchange for the righteousness of Christ. You can't do that. You can only come and submit yourself to that. I hope you've done that. hope you have. And if you haven't, submit yourself to God today. Confess your sins to Him today. Say to him, God, I need your salvation. I can't rescue myself. I can't. God's the Savior. Let him rescue you. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that when you rescue us, you remove us from where we are, were and turn us to what we are now, sanctified, set apart. Thank you that it's not because of our determination, but it's because of your spirit in our lives and your work to separate us, to make us... Uh, to set us on the course to walk in the way of this good works that you have foreordained for us to live in. God, help us to reattach ourselves to that. The church here at Corinth had, had gotten away from that. They'd forgotten who they really were. Started acting like pagans. That's not who we are. Not if we truly trust in Christ. Help us to turn ourselves back to you and say, God, I'm here. I'm your servant. You've bought me. Continue to change me. Thank you that you're doing that, God. We're trusting ourselves to you for that very thing. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.